This x-ray movie utilizes three different patients. The first patient presents with a normal foot following the parameters as described by Root, Weed, and Orion in their book, The Normal and Abnormal Functioning Foot. The talus, which is locked in the ankle mortise in the transverse plane, adducts with the ankle during subtalar joint pronation. Internal rotation of the leg can be seen as the fibular malleolus moves anteriorly in pronation. The talus abducts with the ankle during subtalar joint supination. External rotation of the leg can be seen as the fibular malleolus moves posteriorly in supination. There is more independent motion of the talus on the leg at the ankle mortise in the sagittal plane. The talus dorsiflexes in supination and plantar flexes in pronation. Most of the motion in the frontal plane is seen in the calcaneus and the rest of the foot. In supination, the lesser tarsal bones become less superimposed as the arch heightens. In pronation, the lesser tarsal bones become more superimposed as the arch lowers. The calcaneal eversion can be seen as the increased radio density of the sustentaculum talli lowers in pronation. The calcaneus inverts in supination, and the sustentaculum talli is elevated, eliminating the increased radio density of superimposed bone. The talus is dorsiflex and abducted in a fixed position of supination. In a fixed position of pronation, the talus is plantar flexed and adducted. One additional important factor can be noted. In pronation, the leading edge of the posterior facet of the talus moves anteriorly and occludes the sinus tarsi. In supination, this leading edge of the posterior facet of the talus moves posteriorly, and the sinus tarsi becomes a bullet-holed shape. In walking, the leading edge of the posterior facet of the talus and the sustentaculum talli superimposition will become very important. This patient is walking barefoot, and one can see that as the foot hits, the patient moves into pronation. Prior to the heel coming off the ground, the foot goes into supination. There is very little total motion seen in this stable foot. One will be able to see the supination start just before the opposite leg comes across the screen. This can be noted by observing the leading edge of the posterior facet of the talus. As the patient hits, the foot demonstrates pronation and compression. Supination begins just prior to the opposite leg coming across in front of the screen. The pronation can be noted by keeping an eye on the superimposition of the sustentaculum talli. That area just below the posterior facet of the talus where there is a radial opacity will lower as the patient hits, pronates, and compresses. You do not really see very much pronation or supination in this very stable foot. As the patient speeds up, one can see the motion even better. Heel contact, pronation, and resupination.
there is not a great deal of sagittal plane motion in the subtalar joint. As we watch the same patient walk in gait with a one and one half to two inch heeled shoe, you can see there is much more motion in the subtalar joint. There is a much larger amount of pronation at heel contact along with the compression. There is much more resupination as well. The patient hits at heel contact, compresses and pronates the head and neck of the talus plantar flexus. There is significant superimposition in the lesser tarsal area. The leading edge of the posterior facet of the talus moves to occlude the sinus tarsi. You can also see a large amount of resupination. Once again, you can see the resupination beginning as the leading edge of the posterior facet of the talus begins to move posteriorly, even before the opposite leg comes across in front of the screen. You'll also notice the radio opaque zipper in the boot of this individual. Now, in slow motion, you can see heel contact, pronation, and then resupination. Compression and plantar flexion of the head and neck of the talus. Anterior advancement of the leading edge of the posterior facet of the talus. Maximum compression and pronation, then resupination. You can also see pronation as the sustentaculum talli becomes lowered with eversion of the calcaneus and then becomes more elevated with supination. Also, notice the calcaneal cuboid fifth metatarsal segment. This segment is very stable and you don't get a great deal of motion between the calcaneus and the lateral column. This is a very rigid segment in the sagittal plane. There is tremendous force across this lateral column as the heel comes off the ground. Stability is essential for a normal gait pattern. One will find it much easier to see the motion with the gait pattern speeded up. pronation with internal rotation, supination with external rotation. The most marked difference between the patient walking barefoot and the patient in heels is the amount of motion of the subtalar joint. The direction of motion appears to be the same. This second patient is a patient who has a plantar flexed first ray and in stance has a limited ability to pronate the subtalar joint. In a non-weight bearing attitude, the patient does have a full range of pronation of the subtalar joint. But as you can see, in a weight bearing attempt to pronate by internally rotating the leg, there is very little evidence of plantar flexion of the head and neck of the talus and very little evidence of severe pronation as was seen in our first normal patient. However, in the direction of supination, the individual has a good range of motion with external rotation of the leg and bullet holing of the sinus tarsi. In supination, the leading edge of the posterior facet of the talus moves posteriorly, exposing the sinus tarsi.
With supination, there is a large amount of motion. With pronation, very little motion. And also notice with pronation that you do get a little bit more prominence of the plantar condyle of the calcaneus. This is due to the frontal plane motion of the calcaneus. Patient number three has an anterior cavus foot type with a rear foot varus and also a significant inverted forefoot deformity. Therefore, this is a high arch pronated foot, which leads to lowering of the calcaneal inclination angle. There does not appear to be as much total range of supination and pronation as seen in the first two patients. Once again, the general direction of pronation and supination is demonstrated by our same parameters. Supination shows external rotation of the leg, posterior positioning of the fibular malleolus, and opening of the sinus tarsi. In pronation, the patient occludes the sinus tarsi with the leading edge of the posterior facet of the talus, moving anteriorly. There does not appear to be any resting neutral calcaneal stance position. You seem to move from a position of full supination to full pronation. In gait, most of the motion is in the direction of pronation. At heel contact, the patient moves into maximum pronation and remains there throughout gait. Maximum pronation is seen with little or no motion in the direction of supination until after the heel is off the ground. In gait for this patient, you see a great deal of instability in the mid-tarsal joint region. Notice how the heel lifts off the ground much before there is any motion of the fifth metatarsal and the cuboid. The foot remains stable on the ground for a period of time and collapses through the mid-tarsal joint. This is a marked distinction to the good, stable, lateral column seen with our first patient. The patient hits, pronates, and remains pronated throughout gait. The heel comes off the ground with motion of the rear foot, while the forefoot remains on the ground for a split second. It is amazing the tremendous pressure that this heel off generates through the mid-tarsal joint with this mid-tarsal joint being hypermobile. The patient hits pronated, compresses in a maximally pronated position with very little supination in the stance phase of gait. This is the same patient in a more normal man's shoe. You can see that there does appear to be a similar amount of pronation and supination as seen barefoot. In a fully pronated position, the head and neck of the talus is plantar declinated and adducted. 
The sustentaculum is superimposed in a plantar direction as the calcaneus everts. In a supinated position, the head and neck of the talus becomes more dorsiflexed. The leading edge of the posterior facet of the talus moves posteriorly. You get less superimposition of the sustentaculum talli in supination. There is a great deal of superimposition in the lesser tarsal area and the navicular cuneiform as the forefoot collapses in pronation. Notice how the calcaneal inclination angle does not really change a great deal from supination to pronation. There is frontal plane rotation, but no real elevation or depression of the inferior portion of the calcaneal cuboid joint. There is no resting neutral position either. The patient once again moves from a fully supinated position to a maximally pronated position in one motion. In a relaxed stance position, the patient is maximally pronated and goes to that maximally pronated position directly from a fully supinated position. In gait, once again, we see an increased amount of motion at heel contact, but it is all in the direction of pronation and compression. The patient hits almost maximally pronated and compresses quite significantly. There is very little supination, if any at all. The heel will come off the ground prior to the forefoot moving, just as it did with the patient barefoot. There is tremendous sagittal plane compression force through the lesser tarsal area and the navicular cuneiform area. As you can see, this patient lifts his rear foot off the ground and plantar flexes his rear foot. There is tremendous force across the lesser tarsal area, jamming it in the sagittal plane. It almost appears that the rear foot is attempting to break the forefoot in two every time a step is taken. There is very little subtalar joint motion as measured by previous parameters. The leading edge of the posterior facet of the talus remains anteriorly positioned, occluding the sinus tarsi. There is superimposition of the sustentaculum talli, and that remains at about the same level throughout gait. The motion that one sees here is mostly a compressive force in a direction of pronation at heel contact. There is further compression as the heel lifts off the ground, almost looking like it will break the mid-tarsal joint in two. This is what occurs with hypermobility of the mid-tarsal joint. <laughs>